That's tough to follow, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we'll shift gears here now because, um, you know, this is a talk that follows Marcus Redeker and Peter Leinbaum, <laughs> they're social historians, maritime historians of the Atlantic, about, you know, piracy and rogueness and the maritime world and what that meant for labor history and social history. And, um, you know, I haven't been doing that in-depth type of research, but my remarks will be much more general. Uh, but I have always thought about this question for the Pacific, the nature of maritime activity, piracy, misbehavior. And I tried to wrap my mind around this topic, and I could only make general remarks, therefore. So we're going to cover a few thousand years of misbehavior in the Pacific in the next 15 minutes, so hold on. <laughs> We'll move ahead. I didn't know how to project that image, but here is our globe. And obviously, the Pacific Ocean is the single largest feature on our planet. Ten time zones, 64 million square miles, bigger than all the rest of the land mass on the planet combined. So how do you begin to describe misbehavior on that scale? Well, of course, in the Pacific, we have something unique that wasn't happening in the Atlantic world, and that was the original discovery and settlement of all the Pacific Islands. And this is probably, or this is certainly, the boldest maritime migration in human history. And we have an idea of how this took place from east to west, the Lapita theory migration, the migration of Austronesian voyaging, Polynesian voyaging, and we've sketched out how we think that's happened. We don't understand this, this ancient migration, certainly in terms detailed enough to, to discuss piracy and rogueness and misbehavior, but I will say that you do know the legends of the Matane, and that people here today, some cast their own lineages back to, not to Haiti, but the original wave of discovery from the Marquesas. And then later on, in subsequent waves, came the Tahitians, who were reportedly taller, and fiercer, and that's where the legend of the Manihune comes from. So for the original discoverers of Hawaii, they would have looked at the Tahitians and say, you're the foreigners, mm -hmm. you're the invaders, you're the conquerors, you're the howler. Which is interesting to think about, but, you know, is, is that rogue nature? I suppose. There are a lot of reasons to conquer islands in the Pacific. And, um, you know, having one spot in maritime history, I'm, I'm familiar with the, the hundreds of years of historic piracy and raids and smuggling and kidnapping in East Asia. Now, on the left side here, you see the Wakfo centuries of Chinese, Japanese, and Korean pirates preying on uh, the coastal cities and communities in China. Seasonally, kidnapping, coming back the next season, collecting ransom, etc. This is nothing that the ancient Greeks in the Mediterranean would have been familiar with, huh. right? Typical human misbehavior. And then in later decades, we know historically of piracy in Asia uh, associated with the change of the dynasties and Zheng Chengdun, who was the Ming loyalist. And at this stage, in the 17th century, when the British and the Portuguese and the French begin to show up, they're not even sure who they should deal with. This guy, you know, Zheng Chenggung or Koxinga, is he the emperor or is the emperor in China the emperor? That's how pervasive sometimes piracy was in Asia. If you've heard of, of uh, uh, Admiral Zheng He and the seven voyages of the Ming Dynasty, the Muslim eunuch admiral making the seven fabulous voyages, that sounds familiar to anybody? Mm -hmm. He, of course, with the Ming Dynasty fleets and those seven voyages in the 1400s, had to stamp out various endemic piracy fleets in areas which China had the might to do. Not really the Pacific, on the periphery of the Pacific, but it's almost endemic to areas in Southeast Asia and islands that see a lot of trade passing their coasts. But for the Pacific, I would say, things really get to heat up nicely when the Spanish finally make their way in 1519, Ferdinand Magellan, the Portuguese navigator, sailing for the Spanish kingdom, manages to find his way around Cape Horn and all the way to the Philippines, 
months crossing the Pacific. Mm -hmm. They finally had the technology in those early galleons and canals, the sailing ships that would carry them across the Pacific. They didn't have the understanding to survive the voyage. <laughs> they don't know about germs and nutrition and vitamin C, and they're getting scurvy and they're dying in mass, but the ships made it. <laughs> and what begins then, when they realize the wealth of China is finally at their fingertips, is the circular trade of the Manila Galleon around the Pacific. Silver torn off the backs of the mines in South America, carried to Acapulco, transported by one or two ships every year, beginning about 1565, all the way to Manila, months and months to cross that ocean. Death, disease, scurvy on board, hazardous voyage, exchange for the silks, the porcelains, the spices, the gold in China, return trip up to about 35, 40 degrees north, kind of a big donut circle right around the Hawaiian Islands. No exact proof that they actually found the Hawaiian Islands. They may have. And as soon as you have this route going on, this goes on from 1565 to 1815. This is global trade, because then they carry the stuff over the Isthmus and take it back across the Atlantic. Once you have that going on, you get the British gentlemen, quote unquote. <laughs> um, are they pirates? Are they privateers? Are they sailing with the permission of the English Queen? Is there actually a war on? What they do know is they're sailing into the Pacific, and those galleons are just big, slow-moving targets filled with wealth. And so Francis Drake, Thomas Cavendish, William Dampier, and others, successful captain and navigator gentlemen, were preying on these Spanish galleons. And you can see what they're doing in the red, yellow, and green lines. It's almost impossible to find one or two ships in the middle of the Pacific. It's worse than a needle in the biggest pace that you can ever imagine. So they're hanging out a lot on the West Coast, and Baja, and Acapulco, and Panama. And they're waiting for those galleons to come back down the coast. Or they're sailing across the Pacific over to the Philippines, and waiting to intercept those galleons in, uh, in the Indies. And they do find those galleons, and they do make a mint. This is a picture of a letter of mark, letter of mark and reprisal. If you had not heard about what this is, this is something that uh, I guess we can be proud of in our history. During times of war, it was legal for civilians to outfit their own vessels, arm them, and sail against enemy commerce. Not enemy naval vessels, but take prizes. And so these letters of mark would be issued, and you could do everything a pirate would do, basically, but you wouldn't be hung for piracy because you had this letter saying, I gave you permission. We're fighting this country. Well, Francis Drake, Cavendish, and Dampier, and others, that would have been fine had they had one of these letters, but there actually wasn't really a war going on. So that makes them pirates. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested in this letter of Mark because we thought about it when we were looking at whaling shipwrecks the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And the oldest shipwrecks we've seen so far, have discovered so far in Hawaii, are the Pearl and Hermes. Two British whalers sailing about 1822, 1823, stopping through the Kingdom of Hawaii, and on their way to what was called the Japan Grounds, which was sort of this large group of sperm whale were discovered, and the race was on because those were lucrative whale for the tech of oil. <coughs> That was very, very expensive oil. And they have to sail right past these uncharted atolls. So they crash into the atoll that we now call Pearl and Hermes. And this is an image of the wreck site of the whaler Pearl. About 1822, you can see the tripods and the anchors. And if you can make this out, this is our interpretation, our archaeological interpretation of the wreck site. And you know how we imagine this about 90-foot whaling vessel settled into the reef and fell apart. And what we discovered on the site, the cannon. One cannon, what's it doing there? We find another cannon. These are the cannon here, pretty encrusted over. That's what they would have looked like. Then we find four more cannon. Then we find the whaler uh, Hermes, and we 
and discover four cannon, six cannon, and you think, you didn't only really use these cannons to take waves. <laughs> but as Susan mentioned, these voyages were going out in the early days for three, four years. And you might not have any idea what's going to change when you're out there in the Pacific, the basically lawless Pacific. So not only did you have to defend yourselves, but possibly, maybe you had a letter of mark that was blank and hadn't been filled up yet. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, but that's a whole side of the whaling story that doesn't come out in the records yet, but comes out in the archaeological sites. And then also, the blackberry, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Marcus Redger, I think our line on the Atlantic, of course, they, they dealt with the, the middle passage and the slave trade quite a bit. It's a huge phenomenon in terms of global maritime history, in terms of all of our history, really. But in the Pacific, the slave trade was called the Blackberry trade. And it's very early, 1830s, 1840s. And I kind of left the time frame open because it's sad to say, but, you know, the trafficking in, in persons is still going on. We don't understand it as well in the Pacific as we do in East Asian countries, where they have more legislation, more records. <coughs> but there are four Pacific nations that don't have trafficking in persons as an actual offense in their legislation. But anyway, the historic picture, uh, it, was, it was trading for and or capturing recruits from small atoll islands for labor in the uh, the Guano Islands in Peru, or the plantations in Queensland, pearl fishery in Western Australia. And thousands and thousands of people were taken from those islands. And not many of them made it back. Not all of them made it back. So it is quite a story for the Pacific of illegal activity, trafficking, and labor. It's a sad legacy. Something that's more fun to talk about is just kidnapping sailors in general. I'm glad you mentioned that, Susan, that you know, Hawaiian sailors were kidnapped here, but don't think it's an unusual case. We as humans have a long tradition in kidnapping sailors worldwide. You know, you don't make a strong island nation like England and build the Royal Navy, the wooden wall, without kidnapping your own people from your own villages legally. It was called impressment. Mm -hmm. It was totally legal. The officers came ashore with armed gangs. They came to your village and they took you and put you in the Navy. And we as American colonists inherited that tradition. And I'm sad to say, even for merchant and commercial vessels into the 19th century, uh, there is a considerable amount of kidnapping going on. The case we usually point to is. You know, 1849, after the gold rush began, the influx to San Francisco and its Barbary Coast. What was happening in San Francisco at that time is they needed to find sailors to get on long-distance voyages to Asia. And since there's not a lot that's coming back that way, you probably have to go around the world. And so the vessel has to leave port. The crew doesn't want to get on board. The captain pays the crimps to find the crew. You can drug them, you can hit them over the head, but you'll wake up on the ship. And uh, is it legal? It's not exactly illegal. Because the legislation at that time, 1972 and earlier, and going on later, is that legally sailors were seen as wards of the Admiralty, incapable of making a freeman's contract and deserving special care from their guardian. They weren't capable of making their own contract, therefore it was legal to drug them, put them on board vessels. And that's quite staggering. And that's our history. <clears throat> I'm glad you mentioned the CSS Shenandoah. Here in Pompeii, you can see where those Hawaiian whalers were captured. But here are the rest of those whalers up there in the, in the Bering Sea. But this was during our Civil War. The Shenandoah was a Civil War raider. There's her commander, Lieutenant James Waddell, fitted out to sail against the commerce of the North and went into the Pacific, well, the vessel from the British, of course. Uh, the South and the British were fairly close. <clears throat> and cruising into the Pacific from the East comes up here, and the war actually ends when the Shenandoah is right about here. 
But when the Shenandoah is encountering these whalers in the Bering Sea, these Yankee captains are showing him the newspaper saying, hey, the war is over. And can you blame Waddell for not believing them? Yeah. <laughs> the sneaky Yankee tricks, they could have published those papers. <laughs> so he captures most of his prizes after the war is over. Technically, he's a pirate. He doesn't realize that until he gets down here off of San Francisco when he meets a British ship going back to Liverpool. And the British captain says, oh yeah, here's the paper. So he takes his vessel all the way back to England, turns it in and vanishes into the night. A great story of, of piracy, so to speak. So those are some instances of misbehavior in our history in the Pacific, and it just makes me think in large terms, general terms, of uh, you know, how successful have we ever been in imposing our laws on the maritime world? And the maritime themes of, you know, whose stuff belongs to who? And can I take your stuff and make it mine? Is there something about the ocean that's just so large and the horizon that's just so far away that we never will really establish control over maritime areas? Maybe that's the way it is for us. This merges with some of my own job as a resource manager for NOAA because I look at historic properties around the main Hawaiian Islands, like aircraft, like shipwrecks, and they sometimes belong to people. Vessels, uh, certain vessels within three miles on state bottom lands actually belong to the state of Hawaii. Military vessels, military aircraft actually belong to the federal government. So as feds, we're conscious of who owns what and where those things are located. And that's how our regime in the ocean has come to be controlled. If you haven't seen it before, this is the wreck site map for the main Hawaiian Islands. Uh, aircraft and shipwrecks. There are about 2,170 entries in the database. About 400 of those are confirmed discoveries underwater. Some of those are historic, some not. So there's quite a resource out here. Here's a kind of an excerpt, a zoom picture of our walk. You can see all the green discoveries south of the shore here uh, and things elsewhere. So having thought about you know, who owns what and where is it located, is it actually pragmatic or effective to think that we could really enforce our own laws, our own reservation laws that say, Thou shalt not take something from a federal Navy aircraft underwater. Can we really expect to enforce that? No. <laughs> we can try to educate, we can raise awareness, but that's the nature of the ocean. We can't stop someone if they want to go out there and take something off a wreck site. Let's face it. On a larger scale internationally, this is kind of the same thing. These are the uh, Economic zones declared by the UN Law of the Sea 1982 Convention, which gives status, national status of sorts to large swaths of the Pacific Ocean. We expect to be able to control those areas, uh, the EEZ zones. And uh, you can see it's worked out fairly well in the Pacific. We know where the boundaries are. You can see some contested areas over here in the South China Sea which you are all familiar with. So getting back to the question of whose islands belong to whom, and can I take it, and who's going to stop me? This is the current situation in the South China Sea. There are contending claims for islands called the Spratly Islands, claimed by the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, China, Malaysia, etc. And it's been quite contentious. And many of those islands and scrapbooks are being developed by China to be military installations. Mm. And uh, it's up to the point now where our own admirals admit that anything short of a state of war, China has effective control of the South China Sea. No one's ever agreed that those islands are Chinese, right? And the UN. Uh, uh, court has determined those don't even meet the standards of the definition of islands, but nonetheless, they are being developed by China and they're under effective control. Uh, it's quite a dangerous situation to maintain freedom of navigation in the area. Uh, but lest we begin to feel self-righteous about what looks like China stealing some islands, let's not forget 
that we all did it. I can think of a few islands around here that were stolen. <laughs> and it's a rather <coughs> to make that remark in this building. <laughs> but I'll tell you about something you might not know about, a little bit of roguish pirate type of behavior. This is something that has to do with the preservation field and shipwrecks, and that's kind of my field. <clears throat> a number of World War II vessels in the South Pacific are going missing completely. And here's an image of the barge with the salvaged metal from the sea floor. And you can see the list of these vessels, Japanese vessels, French, Dutch, uh, English, uh, Australian, and this is only, we're only, we only realized this in the past few years. And for folks like me in the preservation field, this came as a real shock. What's going on is there's an international regime, a cabal, that is financing salvage companies to find, you know, mixed salvage crews and take grab dredgers out to Indonesia, and there we are on the edge of the Pacific, and recover these World War II wrecks. It was never really economically feasible or rewarding to do this before. But here's the interesting thing. First of all, they're great sons. And there are some 4,500 sailors, we expect, that have been on these 48 vessels that have been just torn apart and taken to junkyards. Why are they going after that steel? This is surprising. Before the nuclear test in the Pacific, Anyone who forged steel made steel with a very low trace background radiation. After the test, the, the bomb tests in Kenya and elsewhere, you can no longer make that kind of steel. If you're a hospital, and you need to make very fine measuring instruments for conducting radiation therapy or scientific experiments, you need that steel, and no one can make it anymore. So now that steel from the World War II ships is worth at least five times more than it was. And the ships are being taken off the sea floor, many from Indonesia. Indonesia has laws against it, but they don't have the capacity to enforce those laws. Mm -hmm. And besides, we say that all those military vessels are sovereign property, so the Indonesians are saying, well, they're your ships. You do something about it. <laughs> Meanwhile, no one can stop the dredgers because they they operate at night, in the day they can move outside the 200 mile limit, and Indonesia's not going to pursue them in their national waters. Mm -hmm. Pretty strange situation. So, are you, are you exhausted yet from that conversation? <laughs> um, that's just some of my general thoughts about misbehavior, piracy, roguishness, and voyaging in the Pacific. To sum it up, I would say, you know, our history is rife with privateers, smugglers, pirates, rogues, certainly as Americans, as disloyal English colonists, <laughs> we were smugglers and pirates, you know, par excellence on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. People like Blackbeard or Edward Teach, he was a member of his community. Mm -hmm. You know, he was not a bad guy for us. <laughs> uh, and I grew up going to Disneyland and riding the, the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. I don't know if any of you guys remember that. But they had to change that ride and then you still have to do it. And all kinds of weird things like Disney's winch auction, and parents <laughs> chasing the women around. <laughs> I just, when you think about it, it's like, it's just so distasteful. I don't like it right anymore. So, that's one point. Second point to sum up. No one culture has a monopoly on bad behavior. It seems to be a human thing. It's not just the Atlantic. It's not just the Westerners. It's not just the East Asians. Um, Roguishness, misbehavior in the Pacific has long roots. Crime at sea in international waters continues today. And nonetheless, we have this affinity for costumes. We put our own kids in pirate costumes. <laughs> and when you think about what that means, just please don't do it anymore. <laughs> it's just a little too hard for me. Thank you very much. <laughs>
flag Confederate naval vessel. So not a privateer, not, not carrying a letter of mark. It was commissioned to sail against the commerce of the North. No problem with that. You know, we sailed against the commerce of Japan in World War II. We were not privateers. Um, piracy, probably closer to that, although I'm sure many of my friends in the South will find that quite distasteful. <laughs> Uh, but certainly a raider, certainly a better raider. Is that the third term? Pir piracy, privateer? Privateer. Okay. Commercial raider. Commercial raider, certainly a commercial raider. Yeah, that, that type of warfare, preying on commerce during the war, uh, was a, a well established Western tradition. And, you know, we continued that into, you know, World War I. No question. Hello. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what about the various unions in Hawaii and maybe all over other countries who represent sailors? Yes. Are they um, helping the situation? Do they have no programs to look at it and combat it? Yes, absolutely. The, 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 the sailing union, the seamen's new longshoreman's union are, are much stronger now, and they come out and fight against those lack of protective laws for sailors in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, absolutely. And they were not, those were rights that were not given easily to uh, commercial sailors. They fought for them in the docks, on the harbors. And they fought bloody wars against the ship owners to gain those rights. There were terrible things that were going on in commercial vessels. In the age of the tall ships, the iron sh ironhull ships, like fall supply in our own harbor. You know, you could, for a while, you could send a ship out, the ship owners knew this, this vessel was leaking, it's, it's, it's overloaded, but we've overinsured it, send it out. You lose the entire crew, you collect the money. That was big old until someone named Plimsoll came along and said, you've got to have marks on the side of the hull. You can't overload the ships anymore. Said, oh, yeah. You know, they had to pass that legislation and finally stop that part. So over decades, they fought for those rights, and it's much better now. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of the Masters, Mates, and Pirates Union? Yes. What was that about? I know the name, but I don't know what you're about. Well, I know the, I know the Pilots Union, of course. That's something that uh, pilots would go out bringing vessels in. You know, navigator or captains coming in, and they need the pilots itch for the local harbor. And my cousin is in the Pilots Union here. Uh, masters and Mates? Not sure about that. Was it the masters and captains that were being abused so much? Bruce was. The, I thought it was Bruce. Masters and Mates, that's primarily uh, on the West Coast. Uh, Here we have the Indian Gulf. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. I don't know as much about that as I should. Yeah, there's a slide up there on the cramper, I guess, Bunko. Oh, yeah. Well, he was actually in Portland, but he was just one of the famous crimps that had, you know, uh, basically kidnapped more than 2,000 men and women over his career, servicing the ship's captains, ship's owners, uh, working with the taverns, the grog shops in Portland. And he had done something so terrible once. The story was that, uh, you know, there was a ship's crew that uh, got off their vessel, went ashore, was searching for another grog shop that wasn't open. He heard about them, they broke into some building, went down below, and were drinking their fill. He went and he rounded them up and sold them to a ship's captain. What happened is it wasn't a grog shop, it was a mortuary. Oh. They drank the embalming fluid. Oh. They sold 50 dead sailors oh. to that captain, put them on board the ship, put them on board the ship dead. And the ship sailed. And he collected his money. That's one of the it's Joseph's memory uh, bucket of stories. It's <laughs> rather. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming and please